Thank you to all those who have joined us today for giving up your busy afternoons. My name is Kylie. I am the course coordinator. I'm a registered podiatrist. I've been a podiatrist for um, my entire career and it's a profession that I love and I'm super excited to be able to also now move into a new course delivered here at Monash University. Um, I'd echo Shui's introduction um, around acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land. For me, I'm meeting today to you from um, the lands of the Bunurong people of the Southeast Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to any Aboriginal people or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us here today. So what does a podiatrist do? Um, and it is sometimes, it's a, one of the smallest allied health professions. There's only about um, six and a half thousand podiatrists here in Australia. And basically we are the first in foot health. This means we work every day with people who have foot, ankle and leg concerns that impacts their part of their everyday lives. And there is a, a slightly hard to read graphic, but it's taken directly about the capabilities from the Podiatry Board of Australia. And it talks about the skills of a podiatrist being professional and ethical, that they're expert communicators and they collaborate with people on um, the healthcare, disability and industry teams that they belong with. The podiatrists are committed to being lifelong learners and skill developers as part of their, their competency journey throughout um, their career and that they're committed to working in an environment that provides quality care and particularly around minimizing risk to the general public because of the type of work that um, we do and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. As an academic, just to give you a background, I, I still work clinically and it's probably the bit that makes me um, really excited to be a teacher. It means over my career, I've been really fortunate to work in the public sector. I've worked in some of the biggest hospitals here in Victoria. I've managed teams of podiatrists who provide care to people who are inpatients and acutely unwell in hospitals or to people in rehabilitation settings who are um, unwell or going through a stage of transition between their home and potentially aged care facilities, or have had an accident and rehabilitating to come back to home. Um, I've also worked in community health services with adult and child-based teams, and that's kind of where I've landed a lot of my career. And we aim that podiatrists work to both their interests and have diverse scopes. Um, over these years, I've also worked in aged care facilities, providing skin, wound and nail care to some of the most vulnerable older adults in our Australian community. Now I work in private practice a little bit, just a little bit, um, when I'm not here at the uni. And that is about working with children who have complex disabilities and may have NDIS support. So podiatrists work with all ages and all abilities as part of, um, as part of their, their general everyday life. And I'll talk a little bit of, uh, about the sort of things that we do. So the podiatry workplace can be really diverse and I've mapped um, where a podiatrist, I guess, sits compared to some of the other health professions, trying to coax you into this amazing profession. Um, as a podiatrist, you can be a business owner. You can work in private practice, drive your own hours. You can work when you want to, want to work and also employ others. You can work in the public health setting. We have podiatrists across um, Australia in both the public uh, acute or bed-based settings, in rehabilitation settings, in community health, in Aboriginal controlled health organisations, and even working in a government settings where they may be driving policy. And this is where leadership in government and industry come in. And podiatrists are often innovators. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about innovation coming up in some of the other slides and what their roles may be in leadership there. Podiatrists have access to claiming Medicare. So if a GP refers to a podiatrist, some um, patients may be able to claim a Medicare rebate. And one of the, the, um, the attractiveness of this course is just recently the Podiatry Board of Australia has released accreditation standards, which we are working towards, and that is for our graduates to be independent prescribers, that on the day they have graduated and, re and been registered, that they can actually 
where appropriate, write scripts for their patients without additional requirements. Podiatrists can independently refer for medical imaging and their patients get a, a Medicare rebate. And they can also be NDIS service providers and work with participants with complex, um, complex needs and um, within teams of people providing support for, for NDIS participants with complex disabilities. One of the few things we can't do, and you'll see all those um, red crosses, is that referral into hospital and specialists. And while I, I was tempted to put a question mark, there are some podiatrists in some states who are working at the top of their scope that do have the ability to work in an ED and through ED can actually admit people under that, that clear pathway. So while it's technically a cross, it's not something podiatrists generally do, there is an increased recognition in the skill set of a podiatrist to be able to do that in the future. So what is expected then in the Doctor of Podiatric Medicine or the DPM degree? So podiatry is a um, brilliant career if you're interested in science, biology, anatomy, chemistry, medicine, and linguistics or communication. Um, and so what we've, what we've um, as we've developed this, we've taken what we think is the best part of being a podiatrist. We've, we've consulted with our industry fellows as well to be able to create quite a unique course aiming to, to meet the needs of the community and have really um, job ready graduates. In year one, this is where we will learn foundation skills, particularly in prescribing. And podiatry is quite a technical skilled course. Um, we use a lot of equipment to um, assist us with our clinical decision making. And I'll talk to that on the next slide. In the, in the first year, it'll be learning about the types of equipment that we use, and this will be through um, extensive case-based learning and simulation. In year two, we will have um, a subject relating to communication, particularly with the introduction to health and disability sectors. And we also have clinical placement hours and introduction to some of our research subjects. The three subjects of placement hours over year three equate to about 550 hours of placements. And in the next slide or two, I'll talk about where these placements will actually be across, a, across Victoria, but where the opportunities are to also have these placements internationally or, or in different um, states and territories. In year three, we'll have additional placement hours, and these are designed to be the more complex placements. It may be in a high risk foot unit. It may also be in the industry and innovation space. And we're partnering with some of the leading foot orthotic laboratories to create opportunities for our students to spend time in these labs, to be able to understand how orthoses are manufactured and be able to gain some of those skills as part of that. Now, the research component is quite unique to the DPM. It um, goes over the second semester of second year and the first semester of third year. And this is a really exciting part. What, what I think as a researcher is a really exciting part of the degree and something I never got when I was training. Um, you will be guided through development of picking a topic um, or you may actually generate a topic through consultation with supervisors and researchers on placements and you'll develop a systematic review, a proposal of a, of a, a small program of research and this takes um, usually about a, 144 hours or, or one um, six credit point subject. Um, at the same time, then you'll spend time collecting data. Um, we'll get ethics and we'll actually work through developing an example of a publication. Some of you may choose to think this is just the best thing ever um, and, and want to go on and actually publish. Some of you may think that isn't your cup of tea and you'd prefer to um, leave that there and, and, and receive just marks. But it is something that we're very committed to have um, 
to have continuous learners enter the profession and we wanted to embed this research to do just that. So how will you learn? As I said before, that um, we have clinical partners across rural and regional centres in Australia. And that means um, the exciting opportunity to not just spend time in our amazing Melbourne hospitals and, and community health services, but extend out into Tasmania, into rural Victoria, and also having, having chats to some rural partners um, in New South Wales. There's also early, early discussions with clinical partners in Singapore and also opportunities. We've just had discussions in the UK. So podiatry being such a small profession, everyone is committed to, to its growth and learner experience. And one of the things we know, particularly in Australia, is that we have a current maldistribution of access to podiatry across the country. And this means we want to embed as many opportunities for student learners to be able to go through and see the diversity in populations where, where they may choose to practice. Now, the joy of a new course means we've got lots of shiny new toys to play with. So we've got all the, the bells and whistles and the machines that actually go ping. Podiatry is both quite a, a cognitive profession where we have the opportunity to, to, to use our skills in physics and force to understand how the body moves and how the ground interfaces with our wonderful feet, but it's also a technical profession. So we need to be able to be ready to use the equipment that we use to make clinical decisions um, and how we then use that in practice. So we will have uh, we have simulators and we also have the equipment that we can practice. So things like Doppler machines that measure vascular blood flow and how these are the sort of decisions that we'll often make every day as a podiatrist as to whether we may treat someone or refer someone on. Um, we also are really excited that at the um, Peninsula campus, we've just received funding and we're building a multi-purpose space that has some of the best gate technology in the world. Um, this gate technology is something that that um, my team are leading and we'll be able to access to be able to teach students to use simple and more complicated technology to understand how the body moves. Um, you can kind of see a tiny little picture there of a, of a skeleton. And this is an example of the, the technology that we're getting. I was going to put a little um, video in. There's some um, great stuff on the Thea system if you wanted to Google it, um, particularly on TikTok where they create great dances and the use of this technology in martial arts and also in um, some of the, the more visual arts skills such as ballet to understand how the body moves and we're going to have that located here on the peninsula campus in in the next 12 to 18 months which is just fantastic um, as I mentioned, plas um, placement partners um, across Victoria and across the rural health services and across Australia will be something we'll be embedding throughout the course. So I briefly mentioned the teaching and learning facilities. So this course is located on the Peninsula Health Campus, but what we are, um, we are uh, setting our timetables based on teaching intensives, where you'll spend time in your preferred environment, learning the information to then come and perfect it in small group tutorials and on simulation days. Our practical intensives will also be designed to, to not only be the, the typical nine to five, we may run evening tutorials and we may also be running um, week long blocks to be able to help you work at the same time as you study, but also to align to make sure that our, um, our educators who work in the different healthcare spaces, we can have real time educators and educators who, who practice as podiatrists come and be part of the education team as well. Um, I briefly mentioned on and off site learning, and we've also briefly mentioned the movement learning space, which um, we're really excited will be in place very soon. So I guess one of the biggest things is if you do this degree, will you get a job? 
and podiatry is actually a, a profession that has been listed by the Australian government as being in skill shortage. And I know if you watch the news at the moment, almost every health profession right now is being listed as a skills shortage career. However, podiatry is one um, that is meeting both the government's spotlight for um, advertising externally into other countries. I did a quick scan last year, last week, and there's currently 60 jobs that are advertised both in private and public health across the country. Um, this means that at any one time, almost the whole podiatry cohort could be um, could be employed in a new job. Podiatry graduates are also in demand from Australia, particularly with the skill set of independent prescribing in New Zealand, the UK and Canada. Um, our graduates in Australia and our capabilities in Australia mean that um, we are one of the best trainers of podiatrists in the world and we're renowned for turning out really great graduates that work at the top of a podiatrist skill level or scope. As I've mentioned, podiatrists in Australia are, are business owners and team members, they work in government, they're innovators and we have, um, we're very fortunate to have some world class um, researchers in our profession, both here at Monash University and across the country. So then what does a career of significance actually looks like? What happens in your first year? Often in first years, um, the first one to two years following graduation, you'd be employed in a graduate position. And this is designed to be a, a mentoring position where you would have support as you grow into what a podiatrist skill set is. No one expects you to know everything on the day you graduate. It is something that every health professional grows into their skills over years. And we're designing a course to support you to be a lifelong learner. Um, all of us learn new things all the time. And if you practice in any health profession, particularly podiatrists, the same way you trained in a couple of years, you'll be out of date. So we want to give all of our graduates the skills to be able to, to continue to grow. If you choose to work in the public setting, um, you'll generally enter as a grade one, just like many of the other allied health professions, be placed into a graduate rotation position where you'll spend time in um, the acute setting, the community setting. You may do a, um, a pediatric um, rotation, you may do a rotation in a particular rehab, outpatient rehab area. Um, whereas private may look different, uh, depends on the private practice setting that you would enter into. You may enter in as an employee or a business associate and be able to influence decisions in that practice that you're working in. This may involve going through a graduate mentoring program over a couple of years, or it may be just dependent on where you are in a deficit of podiatry. They may be getting you to do as much as you can do as quick as you can do it. There's also the industry opportunities, which is um, a growing area in the podiatry profession. It's really exciting to see um, podiatrists moving into this space. Some pods realize quite early on that they love the profession they don't always want to work with patients that they love the physics side and the chemistry side and they channel that energy into innovation and that may be through orthoses manufacture and me or medical and wound care that actually is a representative type role where they're designing new technology to be able to be used in the future and that's where we want our um, program of research to support this thinking or um, this innovation of the future. But it doesn't stop just when you become a podiatrist, there's other opportunities after that. Um, I finished with a bachelor degree, I went on to do a master's degree and that option is still there, where you go off and you do a master's degree in a specialist topic. At Monash University, we've got the Masters of Wound Care, which a lot of podiatrists actually start to work into. And then others, um, there's other universities that offer masters in sports and exercise science that um, enhance the role of the podiatrist. 
If you've had enough of studying with, though when you finished, um, there are industry credentials that are also available. Um, I've got the industry credential of being a paediatric podiatrist and that's acknowledged by my peers through um, a number of additional um, opportunities. And you also, we're setting you up in this degree that you will be PhD um, candidate eligible once you finish. And that's also something that um, people don't often know. They love research until they do it. And it's an exciting opportunity to move into that in the future. So just briefly on the entry requirements is that um, the requirement is that you have an Australia bachelor degree or equivalent in a relevant area of study. And that's with at least a 70% um, distinction average. We do require that that undergraduate degree be completed in the last 10 years so that you still have knowledge, particularly of some of the key areas. And that's around human anatomy, pharmacology, and we've given some example units there, but we recognise that these um, example units are not the only example units, that there are many more that may be appropriate. And that's something we're developing a key list of, but we've just popped some up for now. Now, there is an English language requirement, and this is in the, um, the handbook. This is also something that on registration needs to be met as well, should you choose to work in Australia. There is an English registration standard as part of the registration to be a, a podiatrist, and that's something to be aware of if this was something that you were considering and English isn't your first language or you are just completing a course as an international student. So I'm going to pause on the last slide, which is the where to find out more. We have the brand new web page that just went up yesterday on all about podiatry. And you can also find the course, um, the DPM course of uh, Doctor of Podiatry Medicine um, in the handbook. Thank you. Shui's just put that up in the chat block, which is great. So I'm going to stop my screen sharing now and field any questions as they come through. All right, thanks, Kylie. Um, we've got one question. Um, it's in regard to turnaround of applications. I understand we have got a number of applications that have come through um, in the past week. Have you got a rough idea as to when they will be processed and when will outcomes be released? Yeah, absolutely. We um, This is a brand new course, which means we are working through the processes. So hopefully the applications will be processed and offers come through um, in, I believe, as soon as possible once we have things checked off. But they are being processed in the next week or two after we have just um, confirmed some of the, the entry requirements with the, the entry people. All right, thanks, Kairi. So um, got another question. Can students expect to be studying together with other current students in physiotherapy and occupational therapy? Yeah, absolutely. It is one thing that we, in the School of um, Primary and Allied Healthcare um, are all on the, the Peninsula campus. We will be sharing many of the similar spaces with other students. We're working towards some units such as our research units being shared units, our foundational um, unit having shared, um, shared lectures, our um, Indigenous allies training also being shared units, and particularly the gait analysis, that is an area that um, both physiotherapy and podiatry um, students require knowledge in, and that will definitely be something we'll be sharing training in the future. All right, thanks, Kylie. We've got a question in regards to quota for international students. Yep. Are you able to share how many yeah, students yeah. you take it? <laughs> At the moment, we're taking five this year. We potentially will increase that in the future. It will just depend on demand. Yeah, so as for 2023, are we expecting a total cohort size of around 20? Uh, yeah, between 20 and 25, a small okay. cohort to start with. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Yep, so, um, and as someone who studied in a cohort of that size when I went through, it's a fantastic size to make lifelong friends. Um, mm. Podiatrists are well known for 
um, working together collaboratively. And this is a great way to, to find future colleagues as well. All right. Um, so we've got another question. Um, does it matter if we have only done second year pharmacology? Would that be approved? It quite possibly would. I would need to see what it is. The, um, the key factors we're looking for in the, in the prerequisites is knowledge in pharmacokinetics. We will be teaching um, safe prescribing and the drugs that a podiatrist can actually access to dispense, administer. Podiatrists have a list of drugs they're allowed to use, including local anesthesia, anti-infectives or antibiotics. Um, right through to, um, I guess, more extensive uh, topical drugs, so drugs you put on skin and drugs you inject like corticosteroids. So we've got a list that we have to work, work with. It's not like medicine where you all of a sudden get everything, but I just do have a list we work to and we'll be teaching to that um, uh, throughout the course. All right, thanks, Kylie. Okay, um, we've got another, another question. So given that it's a small cohort um, yes. and the fact that we're only accepting 20 to 25, would it mean that it's first come, first served or how, how does it work? Oh, that's a great question, Shuri. <laughs> How does it work? <laughs> I do believe it is first come, first serve. Once you do meet the criteria, we aren't okay. um, we aren't applying a, any additional matrix on that. So if this is something you are interested in, I would encourage you to get your application in. We are extending our numbers the subsequent year. So um, our intake will be bigger. First intakes are always kept a little bit smaller so we can manage and and learn together how we're actually going to um, work with our partners and deliver the course here. Mm, yeah, because I think it's a very possible scenario whereby our biomed or science students are probably waiting for offers from medicine. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why would you do it? <laughs> Podiatry is amazing. <laughs> but no, I, I totally understand this. This is um, this is something that we expect. We would love you to choose us first. Um, but we also understand that podiatry is a great course for people who are considering a career in medicine. We we share many different skills just uh, <laughs> down on the foot and leg. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said. Um, would there be an interview if you get an offer? No. No so, interviews, no, pre and post. There is yep. no pre-interview. And as someone who's sat on interviews for medicine students, we did consider it. Um, I, I love doing those interviews. Um, and if you do get into medicine course, I may see you there. Um, but it is something we considered. But no, not at this stage. It isn't something that we're considering. All right. And will there be any Commonwealth supported places? We've got a question about that. Yeah, it's a great question. No, at the moment, there is no Commonwealth supported um, placements. Um, that is a, a decision that is out of our hands. Okay, we've got a question right here. So if I complete the DPM, will I be able to practice straight away as a podiatrist or do I need to you know, take further steps to register for practice? Nope. You graduate, you submit your forms to the Podiatry Board of Australia through APRA, you receive your registration, and on that day, you can work as a podiatrist. You may want to sort your provider number out and being registered with health insurance, private health insurance companies, but on the first day you, you are registered, you can work as a podiatrist. All right, cool. Would there be any opportunities at all for international book placements? Yes, that is something that we are actively seeking for our students. We are very aware that there are countries who don't um, train podiatrists that may be sending students um, to Monash to be able to train them. And mm. it is something that we were, are very keen to work with their healthcare services to be able to provide opportunities for them to be able to experience podiatry in their country. So it would be a limited placement, but it definitely could be worked into one of the placements. That is something we are we are preparing for. 
Yeah, perfect. I think everyone's just pretty much opened up to the idea, open to the idea of, you know, um, trying to work in a different country, learning new things and just getting a feel of the different work oh, environments. <laughs> absolutely. I've got a great working relationship and I've worked in the UK and we've already got commitment from um, a, a university and a couple of trusts that should P Padachis be, um, Padachi students be interested that we could actually organise that. We also have interest from Singapore is one of the areas as yeah. well. Um, Singapore's made a massive commitment to the growth of podiatry. They they don't train any and they need a lot. And so yeah. if we can have those opportunities as well to, to grow experiences outside of Australia, that's a really important thing for our graduate readiness. Perfect. So I think you previously mentioned this. Um, it's been asked again. Yep. Is there a hard deadline for when applications close? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I, I'm i going to throw to Shui to answer that one properly yep. because I don't <laughs> know the date. I'm very sorry, but there yeah, will be yep. a um, We will be updating the website at some stage, but like what Kylie said, you know, it's pretty much first come, first served. If um, we feel, if the, if the department feels that you tick all the boxes, you met the requirements, um, you'll be given an offer um, once, you know, we deem that you are successful. So 20 to 25 places, it will probably fill up quite quickly. So um, get on it um, if you are interested in this um, degree and career. Um, so the next question we've got is, are podiatrists considered doctors as well? Uh, that's a very tricky question. So this is a doctor of podiatry. So on graduation, you would be entitled to call yourself a doctor as long as you don't hold yourself out to be a medical doctor. So the doctor of podiatry does enable the, the doctor title, but it comes with the comma podiatrist after your name. There is guidance similar to a dentist who uses the title doctor, but you aren't a doctor of, you're not a medical doctor. So there's there's guidance for that when you become a registered health profession, uh, a registered health professional. APRA and the Podiatry Board of Australia provides guidance on, on how you can use that title should you choose to use it. Thanks, Kylie. Yeah, that's a very popular question. Like we get the same question for our physiotherapists considered doctors, yep. <laughs> our, our chiropractors considered doctors. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so um, another question we've got is work-life balance. Yes. Do podiatrists have standard working hours or are they expected to be on call or, you know, they have to work extended hours on yeah. some days? That's a fantastic question. And uh, if I put on my researcher hat, I'm a workforce researcher, so I can give you really, really good data on this. Podiatry has one of the best work-life balances, um, dependent on where you work. So if you work in the public health system, you may be required to carry an old school beeper or phone, dependent on which area you actually work in. So you may you may do a weekend shift in ED, or you may actually um, work on ward over the weekend. In private practice, the hours are yours. It is renowned as being a very flexible work environment, particularly if you have family commitments or carer commitments in the future. Many parents work school hours or after school hours. I always, I, I work after the school hours, so my partner picks up the kids. Um, so it is something that is um, traditionally a very, very family friendly or flexible work-life balance um, commitment. and. That's the joys of so many people working in private practice in this field, um, but also in the in the hospital, it's not seen as an acute service where you're you're running around every weekend, but you may be asked to do that at times. Thanks, Kylie. In regards to the course itself, would there be any form of online learning, or will all classes be face to face? Um, there will be um, a blended learn. So what we would hope is that students engage in lectures or interactive learning before coming on campus so that every interaction on campus has meaning for your skills. So that it isn't something we're not overly 
my team is not overly keen for you to sit in lectures. We want you to come to campus and use your skills, collaborate with each other. We, we have a little bit of a, um, a philosophy that you don't do life alone, you don't do health alone, which means developing teamwork from day one um, in your education experience is also something that will help you as a, as a health professional. So there will be stuff that you can do at home in your own time, um, or you come on campus and, and spend time in clinical settings and clinical laboratories and in simulation. Thanks, Kylie. So we've got another question here in regards to offers. <laughs> Lots of keen beans out there. Um, yeah, this is in regards to when's the latest students can accept their offer, you know, given the scenario that they may still be waiting for yeah. an offer from another program. I, I'm going to defer that question and maybe okay. that's something we can get um, put up as part of post recording this. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. We'd have to look up at the university. They, all I will say, though, is it's the set dates that you, the university have. We don't have any additional special dates with this course. So when you're going to find um, anything online around accepting entries or submitting entries, they are the standard dates that every course actually has. Yeah, the offer lab dates uh, would usually be on the offer letter itself. So if you are successful for this program, um, you would be given an offer letter and the lab state will be on the offer letter itself. Unfortunately, we haven't got a date <laughs> for this particular um, program yet, <laughs> given that it's still a very new course. Uh, okay, so the next question we've got is, after completing this course, can we be a podiatric surgeon or do we have to do further studies in order to yep. qualify as a podiatric surgeon? Yeah, that is, um, that's a great question. So no, this does not graduate you as a podiatric surgeon. There are registration standards set by the Podiatry Board of Australia that to be a registered podiatric surgeon, you need to work as a podiatrist for two years. Following those two years, you either enter into a program of study through the College of Podiatric Surgery or through a master's degree. And the only master's degree at the moment is over in WA. Um, doing, going then through that program of study and completing those programs of study, you'd apply to the podiatry board to have your registration for podiatric surgery um, be given. So this is one step if that was of interest to you, but it is not something that we're planning on running here at the uni in the, in the, in the future. All right, thanks, Kylie. We've got a question in regards to scholarships and bursaries. Is yep. there anything like that at all available for this program? <laughs> at this time, no. Um, it is something we're actively seeking. Um, it is something that we have had international interest in providing scholarships as well. So it is, um, I guess it's a stay tuned, but no, not at this time. All right. Thanks, Kylie. I figured so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. We've got another question here. So what is the difference between a foot doctor and a podiatrist? Hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, a lot of podiatrists actually call themselves foot doctors. So um, I guess if you're thinking of a foot and ankle surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon, they are a doctor who has gone through surgical training and has um, has their um, they're then a consultant in in medicine and foot and ankle surgeon. A foot doctor though, um, it's not a protected title, um, whereas a podiatrist is. You can't call yourself a podiatrist unless you have a podiatry degree. And the podiatrist can access Medicare and do all these other things, whereas a foot doctor depends what their profession actually is so all right that, that makes complete sense Kylie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay um so we have a couple more minutes so feel free to pop your questions in a QA and a um, function all right the next question that we've got is salary range yes so what's the starting salary for fresh graduates yeah, so podiatry, um, I saw only last week is incredibly 
um, well paid for a, a new graduate. So your salary range for a new graduate is generally between um, 80 to 120,000. And that can be dependent on where you work. So that's something to really consider if you are entering this field for um, the dollar signs as well. It would depend on both the state, territory and environment. If you were to work regionally, rurally or remotely or in Queensland, they pay really well. <laughs> um, so often the Queensland government has a lot of bursaries for new graduate podiatrists. They, they are severely under, under resourced. So if far north Queensland is your thing, you'll get paid really well to go up there. Um, a lot of private clinics will package up a salary, a car, your super, and, and the range can then look up into the, the 100,000, taking into account you've got a car and you've got super as part of your salary. If you enter into uh, the public health system, you are capped the same way any other new graduate and your salary will be the same as a, a, a physiotherapist, occupational therapist, social worker. Yeah. Yep. So do most graduates start off in the hospital or in different, like in private settings? Like yeah, this? it's a real mix, Shui. It's mm. um we we as a profession we have about a 70-30. There's about 30% of podiatrists who work in the public health sector and about 70% who work um in the, the private sector. However, we know at any one time there is about um 10% of unfilled jobs in the public health system. So that split we think is actually not as big. We, we um, just don't have enough podiatrists to fill all the positions, unfortunately. All right, thanks for that, Kylie. Looks like we are done with questions. Um, have you got any final comments to add, Kylie? No, or... not at all, except that um, I guess to say, look out for your friendly podiatrist if it's something you haven't considered before. If you um, were considering this as something to study, I pretty much know most podiatrists would happily take you for a day where they would show you what it's like to be in this profession if you were interested. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm more than happy for you to reach out if you do have any questions to, um, through the, the usual channels at, at university to ask and it'll get to me if it's something that they can't, can't answer. All right. Thanks, Kylie. Thanks for your time today and thanks everyone for tuning in. So like what I've mentioned, this session is recorded and we will be sharing this video on our website as well. So the link is in the chat. So I'll just pop the link again so that you have easy access to it. So have a look on our website um, in regards to entry requirements as well as what sort of um, documents you may need um, when it comes to applying for the course. But if not, it's pretty much first come first served and we will take uh, whichever students stick on the boxes in the first instance. All right, thanks for your time, Kylie, and we look forward to seeing the rest of you in 2023 at our Peninsula campus.